Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. What I'm going to do over the next few minutes is actually give you a sense of some of the exciting progress at Athersys and a couple of key upcoming uh, milestones that we're really focused on delivering on in the next, uh, in the next few months. Um, we are a public company. I'll be making some statements that are covered under Safe Harbor. So shown here on the lower right is what we consider to be one form of the future of cell therapy uh, medicine delivered in, in clinical form. Essentially, our focus is on developing an off-the-shelf cell therapy product, a clinical-grade product that can be maintained at the clinical point of care and administered after a very simple thaw and an administration procedure, either intravenously or local administration. And I'll show you examples of both of these today. We've been focused on regenerative medicine now for over a decade. And during that time, what we've done is validated that we have a product that has some distinctive characteristics and some unique attributes. We think it represents a highly, in fact, an unprecedented uh, technology in terms of its scalability that can be administered in a very simple and easy to use format. We also have extensive intellectual property around the technology. We have over 130 issued patents on the technology and dozens of patent families under active prosecution globally in the key jurisdictions that we care about. Um, we also have five clinical stage programs. I'm not going to talk about each of these today, but what I am going to do is actually touch on a couple of key programs in the neurological and cardiovascular area. Now, one of the challenges that a couple of speakers earlier alluded to is the fact that if you're a small company, it's very difficult to go after multiple programs in parallel because typically you don't have the manpower or the resources to be able to facilitate that. We made a strategic decision over a decade ago that we were going to approach our development uh, portfolios a bit differently, and that was through the establishment of a broad international network of collaborative relationships with key opinion leaders and leading investigators at dozens of institutions across the United States and in Europe. And that's exactly what we've done. That's allowed us to publish a stream of papers that validate our understanding and the performance of our technology in a range of different indication areas. It's also been a very cost-effective strategy that has allowed us to get a lot of work done without having to spend a lot of money or devote an enormous amount of, man, uh, amount of manpower in each one of the areas. The two clinical programs that I'm going to be talking about today are in the neurological area, our phase two uh, trial in ischemic stroke, and then also I'll briefly touch on the phase two trial that we're just getting ready to launch in the treatment of acute myocardial infarction focusing on end STEMI patients. One of the key attributes, as I mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk, is, is that our product has very robust scalability. We've demonstrated that we can isolate a modest amount of material from young, healthy donors. And as a result of the robust growth properties of our cells and the other characteristics and our process development expertise, we've demonstrated that we can produce banks that yield the equivalent of millions of clinical doses of material from one individual donor. And we've also demonstrated that we can do this consistently across donors with about 70 to 80 percent success from the material that we isolate from young, healthy donors that are typically between the ages of 18 and 25. We've also demonstrated that our product can be administered as an off-the-shelf. It doesn't require uh, tissue matching or immune suppression of any kind, and it has a very long storage life. We've already completed five-year stability studies on our cryopreserved product. It's also demonstrated a very consistent safety profile through uh, five clinical stage programs as well as years of preclinical work that we've conducted. Interestingly enough, as, as you've heard through other presentations during the course of the day, these cells do not permanently engraft. They actually induce healing and tissue repair through a variety of different trophic pathways and mechanisms, which we've actually spent years working to understand and characterize. Um, we actually have a lot of publications that go into the specific details of this, so I'm not really going to touch on it in great depth today. I just want to point out that one of the key characteristics that Sylvia and others have touched on during the course of the presentations, Zami and others, <laughs> That, that cells are multimodal in the way that they can act. They convey therapeutic benefits through more than one pathway, more than one mechanism of action. And that is very distinguishing relative to traditional biologics that, or pharmaceuticals that typically act through a single point of intervention or a single mechanism of action. So we've done a lot of work to actually characterize the various ways in which these cells can actually promote healing and tissue repair. And I'm going to provide you with a couple of visual examples of that during the course of my presentation today. Another point that's come up during the, the earlier presentations is some of the uh, favorable regulatory trends that are actually generating a lot of excitement internationally. Some of those are occurring here in Europe where there's been a recent move towards the incorporation of an adaptive licensing uh, pilot program, if you will, sanctioned by the EMA. But there's been a lot of excitement about what's going on in Japan 
with the adoption of a new regulatory framework there that others have talked about or alluded to, but I want to show you what it actually looks like. So here's what the PMDA is actually talking about. Traditional clinical development in Japan, like other parts of the world, consists of a series of staged development where you have to run phase one studies, phase two studies, and typically at least two phase three studies before you can submit your dossier for consideration for registration or approval. What Japan announced they were going to do last summer and what they passed into law last November was move towards a system where you can run one clinical trial and provided you can show safety and probable evidence or evidence of probable therapeutic benefit, they will grant conditional approval based on that, which means you can begin marketing your product, although you're obligated to then do confirmatory studies in the, in the years following that conditional approval. This has generated a lot of excitement because from an investor perspective, it could dramatically shorten the time frame and the cost of clinical development and the path to market. So we were one of the first companies to actually move uh, to take advantage of this particular uh, situation. We've been focusing pretty significantly in the neurological area. That's gotten a lot of excitement actually among the folks that we've been interacting with in Japan. And here's one of the reasons why. I think most of the people in this room re recognize and appreciate that we're in the midst of an unprecedented global demographic trend right now. The aging of the baby boom population in developed countries around the world is causing a, a massive emergence of a shift in pressure, if you will, on healthcare systems around the world. In Japan, this problem is particularly acute. In fact, what we see in Japan is, is that over the next 20 years, their segment of the elderly population there is going to more than double in size. In fact, that segment of the population over the age of 80 is going to go from 6% of their population, which is what it was in 2010, to more than 14% of their population by 2030. And the corresponding segment of the population over the age of 65 is going to represent more than a quarter of their total population. And this is where a lot of their national health care resources are going. It's putting a lot of pressure on their long-term health care system. They recognize that, but rather than just wonder how they might address it, they actually took action. They, they saw regenerative medicine as providing an innovative set of solutions for the major cost drivers in their health care system, and that's why they moved to implement this new regulatory framework that has been generating so much discussion and excitement. At the top of their health care priority list in Japan is stroke. The incidence of ischemic stroke in Japan is higher than in other developed countries in the world. Every year, there are about 325,000 individuals in Japan that suffer uh, their first stroke. And uh, some of the statistics actually in the stroke area were discussed by Olaf from Renuron earlier, uh, which is roughly a third of the people that have a stroke are going to be le are going to die actually shortly after the stroke. There are about more than 15 million people a year that suffer a stroke. Another 5 million, so 50% of the survivors are going to be left with substantial disability for the rest of their life, and about 50% will show either virtually complete recovery to, uh, to pretty meaningful recovery. This has an enormous clinical, social, and economic cost associated with it. So we've been very focused on stroke as well as other forms of acute neurological injury, which I'm not going to talk about today, and we've also been focused on some interesting opportunities in the chronic neurological area. I'm not going to walk through all, all that we know about the mechanistic underpinnings of how multi-STEM provides a benefit in these types of situations, but again, I'm happy to talk to you, anybody offline if you want more information. The point is, is that they're doing multiple things. They're driving healing, repa healing and repair through multiple different mechanisms. I am going to talk about a couple of specific mechanisms, however, because I think they provide a very vivid illustration in terms of how these cells can provide a benefit. Uh, about five years ago, there was a very powerful publication that came out that, that uh, was very parallel in terms of some work we were doing internally at Athersis at the time. And what it did was it illustrated that there is a very important connection between your brain and your spleen. Most of you here in the audience may not know much about your spleen. Uh, and when I was back at Stanford School of Medicine, as I was talking about last night um, at, at another event, uh, we didn't really think about the spleen too much. You know, we kind of considered it to be one step up from the appendix where you know, it was there, we knew it did something, but we weren't really paying attention to it until we needed to. Well, the reality of it is, is that the spleen is a key immune system organ. It actually acts as a repository for inflammatory cells and other uh, immune cells. And when you, when you suffer a stroke, um, what ends up happening is, is a very powerful signal gets sent to the spleen, which induces a massive hyperinflammatory cascade that then occurs over the days following the stroke which results in what you see here. So this is basically extensive permanent tissue loss in the region around the stroke, which is all induced by the inflammatory cascade or largely induced by the inflammatory cascade that emanates from the spleen. So what ends up happening is, is things go from bad to much, much worse. 
you can actually see the effects on the spleen. Essentially, this, the spleen launches what I refer to as the nuclear arsenal, uh, launching a massive hyperinflammatory cascade. And the, the spleen literally atrophies in the wake of this and leaves the patient or the animal in a, in a uh, severely immunocompromised state. It's interesting that if the patient doesn't die from the stroke, they usually die. The most second, uh, second most common cause of mortality is secondary infection, so things like pneumonia. And it's because the body is in this immunosuppressed state. Well, we've demonstrated that if we administer multi-stem, one of the places that our cells like to go is right to the spleen. And when they get there, they have a profound effect at reducing the inflammatory cascade and upregulating key players like regulatory T cells, M2 macrophages, and other factors that are involved in protecting, preserving, and restoring neuronal health in the region of the ischemic injury. And we can quantitate the results, not only in terms of gross morphology, but also in terms of the expression profile at the spleen as well as in the brain. So we know a lot about how these cells can actually protect, preserve, and induce healing and repair in the brain or following a stroke or other types of neurological injury like traumatic brain injury. And I, I refer to this as the Christmas tree experiment because of the red and green colors. But essentially what you see here is three animals where we've induced a stroke, and then we've actually analyzed a, a gene expression in the region of the stroke, in the tissue of the brain, three days following the stroke. What you see is there's a massive upregulation of a whole host of different inflammatory factors and pathways that are regulating or part of immune system function that are doing damage in the brain. In contrast, you see a significant downregulation of factors that are promoting and preserving and enhancing neuronal tone and neuronal function. However, you see a very different pe picture when we administer human clinical grade multistem in these immunocompetent animals. You see that there's a dramatic downregulation of the inflammatory pathways and factors and a dramatic upregulation of neurogenic, neurotrophic, neuroreparative factors. And we know what all of these factors are. They're not disclosed here, but the point is, is that this provides us with a very deep understanding of mechanism of action and how the product works. This is what explains the work that we published a few years ago that actually drives the durable, robust therapeutic effect we see from multiple preclinical studies that have been conducted independently with leading experts both in the field of ischemic stroke as well as in related areas like traumatic brain injury. Um, in terms of a, from a market standpoint, we see this as a huge area of opportunity. Um, as I mentioned, every year there are about 15 million people that suffer an ischemic stroke, and these numbers are going up because of this demographic wave that I talked about earlier. Just from a, a, an economic standpoint, we think that this represents probably on the order of a 15 to $25 billion a year market opportunity, and here's how we arrive at that number. Healthcare economic studies have shown that if you could develop a safe and effective therapy that overcomes the limitations of TPA, which only reaches about 10% of the patients because it's got to be administered within about a three to four hour time frame, that you might be able to reach a substantial percentage of patients, which is what we believe we're poised to do with multi-stem, because we're treating patients within one to two days after the stroke has occurred, as opposed to three to four hours after the stroke has occurred. And that's because our preclinical data shows that we can do that. If you look at the numbers in the European Union, Japan, and the US, there are about 2.2 million first-time stroke victims every year, uh, as Olaf was mentioning earlier. We think our target population is roughly 1 million of those 2.2 million individuals, the moderately severe to the more severe strokes that, uh, that are occurring. We also, based on the healthcare economic data that we, that we have generated and that others have generated, think that the price point for a product like this, if it delivers a meaningful benefit and is safe, as we think that our product will be, could actually be pretty high. But in our conservative estimates, if we think that it might be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $25,000 to $30,000 per treatment, which we believe would provide a very cost-effective solution, that estimates the market for this segment of the stroke market at about 25 to $30 billion a year. So currently, we're in the latter stages. We're just in the final stages, actually, of completing enrollment for an international phase two double-blind placebo-controlled study focusing on uh, approximately 140 patients. As I mentioned, we're focused on the moderately severe to more severe patients here on the NIHSS scale of about 8 to 20. Um, we're treating patients 24 to 48 hours after the stroke has occurred. This allows us to assess the patients in the first 24 hours to actually weed out patients that are well on the path to spontaneous recovery, which has proven to be very problematic in some prior stroke trials that have been run with neuroprotectant drugs that have to be administered within the first several hours after, uh, after the stroke has occurred. 
Um, we're conducting the trial at leading stroke centers here in the UK as well as in the United States. As I just announced on our earnings call a few days ago, we anticipate completing enrollment for this trial in the next few weeks. That puts us on a path to actually complete um, the, uh, to report the top line results from the study uh, sometime around the end of the first quarter. As I mentioned, we've done work in a number of other neurological areas. I'm not going to have time to talk about that today, but just in the final minute that I have here, I'm just going to talk about uh, the fa next phase two trial that we're getting ready to launch in the, uh, car in the cardiovascular area. So the American Heart Association published a study a couple of years ago that showed that the burden of heart disease, both in the U.S. as well as internationally, uh, is actually escalating at a pretty alarming clip. And that's because of the demographic trends and some of the other trends, like increased prevalence of, of obesity in the United States, as well as some other parts of the world. Um, we've actually taken a, a, a distinct delivery approach than the one you've heard about today. It's a transendothelial uh, microcatheter system that we licensed the rights to a number of years ago. This is very fast, simple, and easy to use technology. This is actual imaging data from the first patient that was treated at the Cleveland Clinic. The entire procedure took about a minute, and the cells were delivered and are maintained directly at the site of delivery through this transendothelial approach which uses a very, very small needle to deliver the cells into the periadventitial space directly in the area around the, uh, as part of the ischemic zone. We published the data from a 25 patient phase one study that we completed, which showed, in contrast to some other studies that have showed anywhere from low single digit to mid single digit improvement in ejection fraction, we actually saw double digit improvements in our ejection fraction as high as 14% in the mid-tier dose group. And this is actually what we're basing our phase two study on in the trial that we're just getting ready to launch in the, in the next couple of months. So again, this is public uh, information and it showed us, even though it was a phase one study, it showed a statistically significant response looking at some very clinically important parameters, which we're excited about. So we're getting ready to, to launch this study. We're focused on end STEMI patients because this is actually the most common form of myocardial infarction. The, the, the frequency of STEMI uh, patients has actually been declining in recent years. So we're concentrating in our 90 patient phase two study on this population. Uh, and with that, again, I didn't get a chance to talk about everything that we're doing at Athersys, but we, uh, we have a robust balance sheet. We have about almost 50% institutional ownership in terms of the equity ownership of the company with some pretty high quality names that are excited about what we're doing and how we might be able to change medicine in areas like stroke, as well as some of the other uh, areas that we're focused on. And with that, I'd like to close and thank you for your time and attention.